So it's my great pleasure to um, welcome everyone to uh, this evening's post-colonial seminar, um, the first one of Trinity term 2020-2021. Um, it's a really great pleasure to have at last, I want to say, <laughs> through no fault of her or our own, uh, Lindsay Stonebridge here to talk to us about some crucial topics that, that, that bind us, interests that weave us together, writing, writing, changing the world, um, humanity, human rights, and decolonization. Um, I'm going to just, just to, so that we know where we are, um, I will invite Lindsay in a moment to, to speak and um, she'll speak for, uh, with some slides for um, up to about 35, 40 minutes. And then we will um, break uh, for, or open rather for, for, for questions. Um, so please feel free to um, place your questions in the Q&A. Uh, function um, at the at the bottom of your screens. Um, so Lindsay is um, is going to speak to her her new book, which um, some of you will have had a chance to read an extract of that she generously um, made available to us. Uh, writing and writing um, on Lindsay herself, she is interdisciplinary professor of humanities and human rights at the University of Birmingham here in the UK. And her recent books include Placeless People, Rights, Writing and Refugees. And that's the book that actually a couple of years ago she was originally going to come to talk to us about. Um, and this was the winner of the Modernist Studies Association Best Book Prize 2019. And she's also the author of The Judicial Imagination, Writing After Nuremberg, which was 2011, the winner of the British Academy Rose Mary Crawshay Prize in 2014. Her collection of essays that we are discussing today, focusing on today, writing and writing literature in the age of human rights was published last year in a very grave year for human rights worldwide under the impact of the pandemic. Her other books include The Destructive Element, 98, Reading Melanie Klein with John Phillips, 98 also, The Writing of Anxiety, and British Fiction After Modernism with our own Marina Mackay, 2007. She's the co-researcher on two current GCRF projects, Refugee Host and Rights for Time, and is currently writing a critical creative book Thinking with Hannah Arendt that I personally am really looking forward to, which will be published um, in 2022. And this work is the focus of her new Leverhulme Major Research Fellowship, um, on which congratulations, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, we are, what a smorgasbord of interests, all very, very um, topical and, and of importance to the post-colonial seminar. So Lindsay, it's our great pleasure to hear you today. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Ella Kay and Anki. And it's, well, it's great to be here sharing a screen with you, but um, like everyone, I think I'm really bored with not being in a room with people. Um, I'm really um, missing the engagement of reading alongside people, which I think is a literary school. People think we're fine in lockdown because all we do is read, but actually we read together. So what I, um, well, so what we like doing is reading together. What I'm going to do today is to introduce um, some of the themes of writing and writing, and then talk about some of the old passes I got to in that collection, and then invite you to do some close reading with me because I thought we're starved of um, reading together. Um, that that might be an interesting or even a fun thing to do when we can't actually be in a room together. And it was actually, I wanted to do that partly because it was in a classroom that the essays in writing and writing started. Um, so I, back in 2011, I taught a course on literature and human rights within the 18th century, literary scholar Ross Wilson. And we began the course in the 18th century and it went up to the present. 
And we did that because one of the claims we were making, it's one I repeat in the book, is that apparently very modern ideas about human rights and writing carry with them the legacies of older traditions of rights, such as ideas about natural rights, moral sympathy, which of course can be good things, but which also were and are entangled with the histories of capitalism, colonialism, and the long histories of political and economic inequality. The context behind um, that work and the kind of turn towards literature on human rights um, in the States and the US and the emergence of third world approaches to international world came with it, came with in the US, Australia and the UK and Europe with a kind of existential crisis about the moral authority of human rights, which was prompted um, most evidently, most strikingly by the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and with the growing neoliberalization of human rights, which was first identified by Naomi Klein. So the provocation I offered in the book um, and in the class, and it's not an original provocation um, by any means, is that the idea that we need, we read to generate empathy for other people, people unlike ourselves, as Richard Rorty unhelpfully puts it, have been oversold. And that I very much agree with um, scholars such as Joey Slaughter, that a kind of literary humanitarianism has crept into our thinking about writing, which is not helping us understand either the terms of modern injustice or the depth of our current human rights crisis. So that was the question. I think that's the question the book leaves open. If not empathy, if not compassion and its hierarchies, if not a modern tradition of modern sympathy, what other ways are they thinking of um, about the relationship between rights and literature or rights and writing. Now, those of you who've read other chapters in the book will know I give several examples of writers and speakers who make very concrete and specific rights claims through their writing. But this is a collection of essays and I, you know, I'm very aware, I haven't published a collection of essays before, that you have that sense of things left underdeveloped because it's not a book. Um, and I've been struck and I've been working with a couple of friendly critiques from colleagues and friends and also about the work I'm doing on a new project called Rights for Time at the University of Birmingham, which is a big interdisciplinary project. The two friendly critiques came on the one hand from Tom, Thomas Keenan from Bard, who works on the Human Rights Project there. And he said quite right in the book that there's a tension and a critique of literal, liberal traditions of human rights and humanism. And the insurgent writing and thinking that Tom said, I clearly prefer. He said, you can't quite have it both ways. But those two, the liberal tradition of human rights um, in its various histories, but in its modern history and the insurgent tradition of writing and, and thinking come together. So there's a question left about how you might think about those two traditions together. And it was a legal critical scholar, Stuart Lenta, um, who made this question much more explicit for me recently, um, partly in his book, Archives of Sovereignty, which is a very excellent book, which I, I can recommend. Um, but he queried um, in a paper he gave my attachment to a concept of human time, which I was trying to oppose to the modern times of rights and oppression in the final chapter of my book, the final essay, which is on Buru's Bushani's um, No Friend But the Mountains. Um, and so that those two things, sort of how do you think about those traditions together? What's the attachment here to the category of the human? Do we need it? How can we rethink it? Oh, the two things I want to push a little bit further um, with you today. I thought I'd start, I, mean, I think, as, as like I said, you know, this is a crisis year for human rights, and I think there's a paradox which is in modern human rights, which has become very, very apparent, if not um, horribly stark, which is the untimeliness of human rights themselves. And if you look at the modern history of human rights, there's a really notable congruence between the development of ideas and their practices and institutions of international humanitarian law um, that go all the way you know, all the way through up to the present day with the recognition that modernity particularly modern war had put the world out of time so if you if you look at the origins of modern humanitarian law and human rights in the late 19th century um, that, that that emerged out of a sense of untimeliness 
that has prevailed. So I think it's really striking that at the very moment you have a kind of historical, political and philosophical recognition of the breakdown of time as an ongoing story about human progress. So for example, in Nietzsche's untimely meditations or in Freud's timely thoughts, which are actually found the untimely thoughts about war and World War I, or the break with tradition and authority that Hannah Arendt and others later theorized in the wake of totalitarianism. At the very moment you have all those breaks in a sense of time, you have the beginning of liberal internationalism, you have the Hague, you have the League of Nations, you have the United Nations all the way up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, to the present. So in other words, and this is a point that legal theorists will make, there is a case for saying that modern human rights have always been out of time, that there's an untimeliness that's built into their history and structure, and this might be one of their defining characteristics. Now, I would like to argue as part of what we're doing with rights of time, that we can think of this untimeliness as productive, productively, which is to say, yes, modern human rights are partially synonymous, an anachronism, they're anachronistic, they're Eurocentric, they're based on out-of-date humanism, and they're woefully belated in terms of the long and criminal history of human uprooting. But, and maybe more interestingly, they're also out of time because of the particular history from, modern, from which modern history, modern human rights emerged, i.e. the ruins of colonialism, total war, genocide, anti-colonial struggle mean that human rights are enmeshed in the present, in a place that Hannah Arendt describes as between past or future. So there's a sort of two stories, I think, around, or two ways of thinking about the untimeliness of human rights. This sort of other time, the time that falls out of the archive of sovereignty, to borrow Stuart's um, expression, I'm going to call for now just minor time, I just trying to think of another expression. And what I mean by this, what I want to explore, what I think we can explore through writing, is on the one hand, the often inhuman times, the violent times into which those who fall into the cracks between and increasingly within nation states and global governance. So that's on the one hand, the, time, the times you're pushed into when you're uh, rendered rightless, when you're a refugee, when you're displaced, when you're poor. Um, when you're disenfranchised, when you're, when you're not granted citizen rights. And on the other hand, the other times, the other temporalities of life that are revealed and sometimes reclaimed through those very exclusions. So I'm, I'm trying to think about human rights and human rights deprivation as um, in terms of time as a kind of um, good, I suppose, in a way. So I thought just to explore a bit more and to do some close reading um, with you. For the rest of this talk, I want to just touch on three texts, which will, I think will be familiar to most of you in this seminar, all written by placeless people, all written by refugees, um, that correspond, I think, to three pressure moments in the modern history of human rights. And all of these three texts are in some ways concerned at different points along the story of with the gap between past and future with that that kind of inbuilt untimeliness and for ease I'm just going to call these three moments and you'll see why in a minute stocking coffee and a flower resembling chamomile now the stocking as some of you will already guessed is Eric Albach's from um, my nieces the coffee is Mahmoud Darwish's and the flower resembling a chamomile is Beru's Blushani's so let's start. Nikki, can I just have the first slide? Yes, there we are. There's Eric. There's Arbach. So as you know, Arbach's classic masterpiece, as Edward Said and others had argued, is not only the foundational text of modern comparative literature, but also reveals how um, that foundational history is a story of displacement and exile. It's a text that, as you know, was written um, while um, Arbach was in exile um, from Heidelberg, that great sort of centre of, of worldliness and world time, um, Karl Jaspers University in Istanbul, where he was working, among other things, on working on a new national programme for a secular human, uh, humanities programme in Ataturk's Turkey. 
And so the text, which hopes to retrieve, and this is part of the argument of my Mises, something of the humanism of Goethe's world literature out of the ruins of nationalism, colonialism, and genocide, is at base also a refugee text. It's a very, um, um, it's a text that's very, very consciously out of time. When I was thinking about this, I hadn't remembered until I read it at the reread it at the week, not the whole thing, the weekend, <laughs> we read bits of it over the weekend. Um, the Arbuck uses Marvell's um, famously seductive lines about the preciousness of time, had we but world enough and time, from his coy mistress as the epigraph to the whole thing. So Marvell, as you, as you remember, its point is that his mistress and him don't have time for the poetry and exquisiteness of flirtation, so they should just get on with things. But in the process of complaining, of course, what he does is reveal the wondrous, precious beauty of just that time of seduction. So the historic way to the sense of not only lost time, but of a lost world, had we world enough, well, had we but world enough and time, gains the kind of real pathos, I think, in the last chapter from my nieces, in which Arbuck analyzes the famous stocking passage from Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, which was published, you might want to remember at this point, only 20 years before Arbuck was writing. Now his point is that Woolf's modernism, like Proust's, represents the final break with the Western mimetic tradition, which began with that, that a wonderful opening passage with the close attention to human detail that Homer gives in um, Euclid's recognition of Odysseus scar on his foot. Now, Wolf's novel, by contrast, labours to escape what Albach calls really evocatively, this phrase really jumped out at me um, at the weekend, um, the hegemony of exterior events. This is what she's trying to do is escape the hegemony of exterior events. And you remember that the, Albach was a Jewish refugee at that moment, and you could see him reading precisely to try and escape the hegemony of exterior events. This crushing, this is another term he uses that um, I was really arrested by, omnitemporality of events, the crushing omnitemporality of events, Albach argues, began to be felt um, in, in the 20th century at the very moment which gives to the lighthouse its context but which is famously only mentioned in parenthesis in the novel, i.e. World War I. That moment when, as Walter Benjamin also pointed out, storytelling had to learn to reckon with the crushing sense of a time sweeping humanity uncontrollably and repeatedly into the non-times of accumulated violence in storytelling. Now, what Albert loves about Wolf, what he really likes, is that in her effort and you can really see the kind of, you know, the sense of trying to reclaim that um, plural Goethean project um, of, uh, of a universal humanity. What he really loves about Wolf is in her effort to escape the oppressive omnitemporality of reality. Um, she recreates or preserves a common world, a plurality, by seizing hold of a random moment, measuring the stocking and letting her prose run it. At the moment, you'll remember, is Mrs. Ramsey measuring um, the stocking with looking her knitting for the stocking for the lighthouse boy against James, who's fidgeting his leg. And in that moment, Wolf releases a chain of associations that go on then for about eight pages, roaming not only through her memories, but down through and up into time into those of other characters. She makes the entire world out of a random moment. And I'll just remind you, this is what he says about that moment. He says, to be sure what happens in that moment, be it outer or inner processes, concerns in a very personal way the individuals who live in it, but it also, for that very reason, concerns the very elementary things which men in general have in common. It's precisely the random moment which is comparatively independent of the controversial and unstable waters against which men fight and despair. It passes unaffected by them as daily life. The more it is exploited, the more elementary things which our lives have in common come into life. The more numerous, varied and simple the people who appear as subjects of such random moments, the more effectively must what they have in common shine forth. I was really um, quite gobsmacked when I reread really that passage because I haven't registered um, when I first read it, when I last read it. The sheer passion of Arbach's late, not only his late style, which I used to talk about it, uh, in relation to my Mises, but his late humanism, that kind of call for uh, universal philology, not of the nation, but of the earth, which you'll make a little bit later, is really, really powerful here. So the more crushed by time, the more pushed out of the common world, um, in wolf texts at least, the more a shared humanity is revealed. So what we have on the one hand, 
1942-1944 and this 1946 publication date, is an affirmation of how literary particularity can reveal a human connectedness deeper than the hegemony of reality and outside the omnitemporality of modern war, the nation state and totalitarianism. And what I'm very drawn to in this account is the recreation of human time out of the contingent, the random, the difference, as against the historical and political weaponization of time. It's a kind of literary claiming of the right to time. But of course, on the other hand, world literature from this perspective is unapologetically, even aggressively, redemptive. Like the human rights regime that is establishing itself at precisely the same time, the Universal Declaration, 58, 1951, Refugee Convention, Arbach is still trying to reconnect with the lost times of a Western tradition. There's a squash, you might say, on worldly time, a kind of built-in anachronism. So that's Arbach. Coffee. So can I have the next slide, please, um, Nikki? Great, thank you. So the extent to which the opposite is the case, the extent to which writing cannot redeem the inhuman times of war and dispossession, is the very stark truth revealed in Mahmoud Darwish's prose poem memoir, Memory for Forgetfulness. This, I mean, it's an astonishing um, text, um, really well rendered um, in Ibrahim Mahali's translation, which is just terrific. It's an autobiographical text which recounts Darwish's last day in Beirut in August 1982 during the Lebanese War. So the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization to which Darwish belonged, were besieged under constant Israeli air bombardment and they were placed right tight in the Corniche, um, which is on the, on the um, coast of Beirut, then right on the, on the peninsula. So they were really sort of stuck up against the sea and being bombed. Now, the, the, the houses and buildings that the PLO had, um, which were all bombed to bits, were redeveloped by Saudi money um, in the late 19th and early part of the 2000s. So if you walk around, it's actually a shopping centre, but it's exactly the same sort of buildings that the PLO would have been to. So it's a very, very weird experience of different times being in the same place. So that this was the last day and they're about to um, evacuate for Tunis and just after Tunisia when the PLO moved um, and after they left the Israeli moved in, moved in and one month later you had the infamous massacre of the Palestinian refugee camps Sabah and Shatila to the west of the city by Lebanese phalangists which took place under the watchful eyes of the Israeli defence forces. Now this moment 82 I think it's fair to say was the bleakest and most deadly moment for the Palestinian movement since the Nakba in 48, in 48 just after um, Arbat published our thesis. Now, like Arbat's text, Memory for Forgetfulness is a text written in exile. In fact, it's written in double exile. Darwish wrote his memoir feverishly, um, largely in solitude in just a couple of months in Paris. Anxious, he said, to preserve that last moment, not just of Beirut, but what, what Beirut stood for, you know, an imagined democracy, he says, quote unquote, a place that could accommodate the chaos of multiple exile. That particular chapter of Palestinian history. And his epigraph, which again I haven't paid sufficient attention to, is said, c'est précisément parce que j'oublie que je lis. It's precisely because I forget that I read, reads his epigraph. And that's from Roland Bart and from um, S.Z. Bart's meticulous analysis of um, Balzac, Saracen. And indeed, Balzac is the subject of the chapter that precedes Arbach's chapter on, on Wolf in my Mises. So you get that same kind of connection between polarity, loss, and exile that you do in Arbach. But of course, it's not just the experience of the root that Darwin wants to recall, but what he calls, quote, the cosmic, cosmic, not world, cosmic isolation of the Palestinians in Lebanon. The, quote, forgotten ones, deprived of rights, political, civic, or judicial, suspended in permanent limbo. So memory for um, Darwish and, and for the Palestinians he's writing for is not as it is for Balzac, Bart or Albach. It's, it's an unasked gift. It's not something you desire. It's an unasked gift. Quote, the, for those forgotten ones disconnected from the social fabric, these outcasts deprived of work and equal rights, Darwish rights, are at the same time expected to applaud their oppression because it provides them with 
the blessings of memory. So while it might look like Darwish is, um, and he certainly is nodding to the tradition of Argarh's modernists, in fact, he totally inverts the grammar of lost time. In Darwish's text, there is no escape from the hegemony of external events or from omnitemporality. Omni and that is his point. So if we look, for example, at his description of making a cup of coffee, which is goes on for about the first four pages of, well, not the first four pages, but in very, very early on in the memoir. And it's sort of like, you know, a stocking moment. You think what you're going to get is a random moment of contingency that then spreads you into this worldly time. But actually, it's the opposite. So he says, how can I diffuse the aroma of coffee into my cells when the shells from the sea lay down on the sea facing kitchen, spreading the stink of gunpowder and the taste of nothingness? I measure the period between two shells, one second, one second shorter from the time between breathing in and breathing out between two heartbeats. One second is not long enough for me to stand before the stove by the glass facade that overlooks the sea. One second is not long enough to break, to open the water bottle or pour the water into the coffee pot. One second is not long enough to light the match, but one second is long enough for me to burn. So that interval opened up by Will's description of um, the measuring of the stocking is kind of smashed. This actually goes on for pages. Other cups of coffee are remembered, other kinds of coffees are remembered, remembered, assessed, longed for, evoked, and indeed across the book. But this is the whole point. The point is there is no time for coffee, and it's beautifully um, deceptive, but disturbingly deceptive. So much so that I would think it's significant when I think of Darwish's book, when I try to describe it to people, and I haven't read it for a while, the first thing I think of is the coffee. You know, you can't read these passages without wanting a cup of coffee. It's so brilliant. But the, the kind of central drama of the book is not the coffee, it's the vacuum bomb, um, which um, is described later on in the book as pulling down an entire block of um, full of people in the entire apartment block full of people. And the vacuum bomb um, does exactly what it says it does. It literally sucks the life out of buildings so that buildings sort of um, collapse from the air being sucked from outside them. So, so well trained, I always think, when I think of my own reading habits at that point, that I've become in finding the redemptive moment a la Arbach. Um, but I do so at the cost of, of, of not grasping the absolute violence that occasions those times themselves. So with those kind of pleasures and pulls and difficulties and complexities of writing in mind, it's no accident that another strong theme throughout Darwish's text is the political historical value of writing and its adequacy, the question of its adequacy amid the violence of displacement and besiegement. And this, of course, was also vigorously being debated both um, within the Palestinian movement and wider in Beirut. And a lot of the book recalls um, arguments he's having on his last day with poets and, and, and critics. And indeed, at one point in the book, he reprints um, an editorial that he wrote for Al Kamel, also in 1982, and he reprints it in the book. It's galling, then, Darwish says of this, that we should be ready during these air raids to steal time for all this chatter defending the role of the poet whose rewriting is unique because it is rooted in his relationship to the actual as it unfolds. So rooted in his relationship to the actual as it unfolds, that we should be doing this at this moment in which everything has stopped talking, a moment to share creativity when the people's epic is shaping its own history. How then can the new writing, which needs time enough for leisure, crystallize and take form in a battle that has such a rhythm of rockets. It's an extraordinary passage. I'll be really interested to get um, your insights into it. Now, the late Barbara Harlow, um, late and brilliant Barbara Harlow, reads this passage um, in a, a memorial issue of a journal on Darwish as an indictment of human rights, as Darwish indicting um, human rights. How can you have poetry when there is no justice? That kind of waiting. You can't write the poetry until you're given the leisure and, and, um, to have it, and you can't have it while you're still fighting for justice. Now, now specifically, she uses it to question the, um, of the impotence and I guess also the capriciousness of the universal jurisdiction of human rights. 
particularly in relation to Palestinians who have, um, to put it mildly, been pretty consistently failed as points by the human rights um, regime, partly, but by no means exclusively, because of the problem of territorial jurisdiction. So, I mean, a lot of human rights are fought out on who, what, what rights regime, what law has jurisdiction where. And if you're not within um, um, a comity of nation states, that question gets really, really problematized because you're literally both out of place, but also out of the place of law and the time of law. So Harlow, in her reading of this passage, um, reads it proleptically. She looks forward to um, the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which happened just literally a month after um, Darwish left. And what she's using it to criticize is the first UN report, which neutralized Israel's involvement. And then she then, in a really interesting reading, looks forward to um, the Goldstone report, which did indict the IDF, and which was one of the first human rights documents to make an explicit connection between Palestine and South African apartheid. Um, so that, that, that's, you know, again, a question of jurisdiction, but it's a question of spatial and territorial jurisdiction. I, I think it's a brilliant reading, but I want to add to that that Darwish's sense of writing being crushed by the hegemony of external events also asks us to consider more seriously issues of temporal jurisdiction, i.e. the long times of violence and the long times of rights and the statute of limitations that is built into human rights too, and is as often as successful as denying justice as um, territorial jurisdiction. Most obviously the one day in August he writes about, and this is like one of his Ulysses, it's August the 6th, and he's quite explicit in the text. It's not just the last day of the Palestinians in Beirut, it's Memorial Day for Hiroshima. He says, quote, the month of August, and he's being explicit to make that connection, is dirty, boring, arid, and murderous. It favors endings with long beginnings, endings that don't begin or end. It favors endings of long beginnings, endings that don't begin or end. Also, don't begin, don't yeah, endings that don't begin. So that line of genuine political power that connects the first use of the atomic bomb to Israel's experimental use of the vacuum bomb in Beirut is very direct for Darwish. And so too for him is the expulsion of people thrown out of time, thrown in, into endings that don't even begin a mourning or loss without term, an omnitemporal violence that is disguised but not put right by memorialization for regret and refusal to make connections both across territories, and that's why I agree with Barbara Hollow's reading of this passage, but also across time. So writing for Darwish isn't entirely impotent against such omnitemporality. But the plural world brought into focus in the random moments which are so treasured by Arba. And I think we should note this is further away, not in 1982, not closer than it was in 1945. So last example, and then we, we, we can talk a bit more detail maybe about some of these passages or um, for the book. So my final example is from Belarus Bishani's astounding account of Australia's Manus Island Regional Offshore Processing Centre. No Friend But The Mountains, which, as many of you will know, was written when he was illegally held there, largely through WhatsApp messages and translated um, with his collaborator, the philosophy and philosopher and literary critic, Konrad Tefirgen. The text is at once part memoir and part analysis of what Tefirgen and Bashani call the Kiriakou system, a self-producing, and I'd add, totalitarian regime designed around slow violence that dominates the life of the prison and indeed of the regime. Now, as I argue in Rights and Writing in the final essay on um, No Friend But The Mountains, the Manus and Migrant Refugee System, much like the contemporary European one, is a direct rights violation of human time. This assault on time, possibly paradoxically, actually originates in an effort to get round the jurisdiction of universal human rights. So the 1951 Refugee Convention and later conventions on statelessness specifically prohibit reformal, um, that, that is the deliberate sending people back to the country they are fleeing from. 
so it's reformable, is, is explicitly prohibited. So what regimes uh, now are trying to do is to get people to return voluntarily. Um, and how they're doing that is to make that the time they are imprisoned, the time they are detained, the time their applications are being considered processing, intolerable. And this is exactly what the totalitarian system set up in detention centres are designed to do. As the Australian immigration minister says directly and unashamedly to prisoners in manners when he visits in a passage that um, Bushani recounts, quote, you have no chance at all, either you go back to your countries or you will remain on Manus Island forever. And he could, of course, be speaking for any number of immigration or home office ministers who don't, who will remain nameless because they don't need to be, need to be named in this context. So if you read the text, then in the analysis of the clerical system, at a number of micro levels, time in the prison is deliberately wasted, prolonged, made pointless, by endless bureaucratic systems of ranks, queues, lists, time is made to degrade and to kill. He says, this is what life has become after all. This is one constructed for human life, killing time by leveraging the queue as a technology, killing time through manipulating and exploiting the body, um, the body susceptible to the gaze for others. That um, passage there is from chapter 11, which I think is one of the book's most disturbing and brilliant chapters, um, which describes in acute detail how the slow time violence of the camp is internalised into self-harm and eventually suicide. But, and this is characteristic to the book of, of the whole, in this chapter two that you get this, which I put up on the slide, most extraordinary description of flowers resembling chamomile of another time. Bashani, um, in, this, in the, the, the passage which opens up this chapter, like, was describing how he likes to escape from the camp at night time into the jungle, where he encounters, and this is the quote, long white flowers that look like chamomile have grown, that have grown all around the strip of wood, as if someone with a particular finesse has scattered seeds along the sides of that bit of, a tree, bit of a tree. A few of the flowers have risen in a phenomenal way, I love the use of phenomenal there, um, from under the broken part of the tree with a gorgeous twisting maneuver, they have raised their heads towards the heavens. I feel that there is a special connection between the flowers and the spirit of this coconut tree which has died young. The corpse of the young coconut tree has been chopped down by a merciless saw. It will last out there for years until it rots away, until it deteriorates bit by bit and is absorbed back into the dirt from which it was born. It's a stupendous passage. The flowers only resemble chamomile because they're utterly particular to Manus Island, to its flora and fauna, and so actually can't be subsumed under colonial taxonomies. And those of you who know the book and the films that are made around it, but the notice it's great amount of attention paid to um, you know, the nature of the island and, and Manus people, um, which is um, in another time, in an uh, outside of the time, also subject to the time of colonial occupation. And they live the chamomile flowers resemble chamomile gorgeously in connection with the dead tree which also lives out of the time of either the prison or the nation state and the, and the, and the time of another life and another death but as you can tell this is not a straightforward escape from the hegemony of external events no nor less is it a redemption of the violence of only temporality the corpse of the coconut tree in this passage looks forward to the death of another of Berenice's companions, um, uh, a man who he calls the Smiling Youth, who was actually a young man named um, Hamid Kazi, who turned Manus Prison, Manus, Manus Prison's violence on himself. Um, he he, 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 he sort of cut himself, succumbed to his injuries, and finally died, or perhaps more accurately, was killed. Now, the moment with the flowers, which, as Baru says, seem to live with him and respond to him, he just talks describing about how the flowers seem to move um, and are kind of, kind of cross with his presence, as if they're kind of cross with their presence, which create a kind of counter time to the times of violence, which are also described relentlessly in the book. And there are many such moments in the book, 
um, where this, um, this, this, these random moments, these random observations, as I've argued previously, as I argued in the likes of time, following Hannah Arendt and Paul Ricoeur's attempts to grab back human narrative from violent modernity, the source of an extraordinary affirmation of plural and human time. And I think there's something also, not just in Bashani's writing, but in the construction of the book, which embodies um, a, a human plurality. It's sort of is co-produced, it's in different mediums, it's working at, at different levels. And there's a sort of human plurality, which is very much um, at the heart of the production of the book. Again, a kind of minor time, which is another time. But it's not, and this is what um, Stuart Motor has really helped me understand with his book recently, it's not just human time in the sense of bios or narratable biographical time that's at stake in this reclamation. Neither is it just the plural and contingent world, to go back to Alba or to Arendt's description of the great storybook, which she says grounds the human condition. It's not just those times, nor is it only the time of justice and liberation mourned by Darwish, although it is those times too. If the flowers resembling chamomile release a random moment of connectedness, it's also because of that explicit connection with non-human time, or perhaps with what Marx, as both Etienne Balabar and um, um, Dipesh uh, Chakrabarti have reminded us recently and very urgently once described not as human beings, but as species being. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now. So this is all very tentative, but I think if you run a line from Arbab through Darwish through to Bushani, then several points, three points of commonality and change emerge. First, what's shared is a writing of time that is both produced as a consequence of and in opposition to the degradation of time by modern technological warfare, mass displacement and imprisonment. So there's a shared sense of a writing of time that's produced as a consequence of and in opposition to the degradation of time. Second, the inadequacy of modern human rights to protect time. And that you can see from um, um, the refugee moment of 48 um, through the 1980s through to contemporary migrant and asylum regimes. Lastly, an urgent sense, and perhaps it is indeed urgency, which really connects for me these three very, very different writers, an urgent sense that writing, poetics, lives in the present and as such is also living in a counter and real time that could be given form, at least, in through creativity. This is not, I think, redemptive, but is a kind of more of a staking out of the claim to lifetime, a right to lifetime, and to lifetimes from within um, its degradation. So one final quote from Mamu Dawish on where this might put the writing of time. And at one point in the book, Dawish says this, and I'll say it twice because it's a very important passage, I think. Quote, in writing, we give expression to our faith in the potency of writing. So in writing, we give expression to our faith in the potency of writing. From this perspective, we don't feel we're a minority, but announce that we're the minority majority. From this perspective, we don't feel we're a minority, but announce that we're the minority majority. And we announce that we are children of this age, and not the past or the future. So that between past and future evoked by Arendt and others um, is precisely what Dawish is um, claiming through writing. And I'd argue that is also present, although qualified in Arba, and indeed um, um, beautifully in Bushani. So in writing, we give expression to our faith in the potency of writing. From this perspective, we don't feel we're in a minority, but announce that we're the minority majority. And we announce that we're children of this age and not of the past or the future. Okay, I will stop there very well, where I've given you a lot of words. Thank you so very much, Lindsay. This was absolutely wonderful. You know, the, 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 the calm urgency and the calm passion of, the, of your research, of your scholarship, of your writing was very beautifully conveyed despite all the kind of distancing of this medium. Um, 
again, to repeat uh, what Elika said, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. Um, I'm happy to kick off with uh, one of my own. It's very strange, Lindsay, today, you know, for my 1760 to 1830 paper, I was teaching Wollstonecraft and I was also teaching Dorothy Wordsworth. And, you know, they're both kind of trying to look at rights and writing. Um, and they're both kind of writing to time, you know, um, Wollstonecraft writing to the French Revolution, writing to kind of, in a way, the, the, the re-envisioned conduct book tradition in light of the um, uh, French Revolution, but Dorothy Woods, but also, you know, looking at the, the way in which she keeps time in her journal, you know, and one of the reasons I was discussing with my students and they had many more insights than me, uh, we find that chaotic is because we tell time in a very solar calendar, in a very kind of, you know, masculinist mode of organizing coherence and organizing narrative, whereas there is Dorothy Wordsworth, you know, weeping for a strange person who died kinless, and immediately she's like doing laundry and ironing shirts until 7 p.m., and we just don't know what to make of this writing to time. So my question is, um, in a way, going back again to the writing and writing the two different, the interconnected, uh, you know, the march to death of writing to and writing, what are the kind of literary forms that emerge from some of the negotiations with time that you have just described, whether it is, you know, being in limbo, imminent time, omnipresent time, lost time, interrupted time, you know, what you ended with Darvish's, a kind of, in a way, disavowal of cultural memory, because that's the condition of survivance, or the condition of survival, you know, that if I keep thinking of the past, I can't live. So, in your research, what are, what are the different kinds of literary forms that you think are emerging from this war zone, you know, as, as we try to find new ways of keeping to time, reinventing time, and also writing to time? Thank you. No, that, there's a, that's a terrific question, and I, I'm just sort of seeing who's here. I know there are people can, who can answer this probably better than I can, but I think I love the writing to time that you used um, there. And I do think um, um, that when, when there are, are breaks in time or something happens to historical time, political, political time, are moments of um, innovation. So it's perfect that you've been teaching romanticism um, because it's precisely, you know, um, you know, trying to find form for a revolutionary mode of being. Um, but then, of course, you're quite right. There's one way that this story is told, um, where the other times of that story are, you know, the washing, the laundry, the worrying, are not told, but as innovative. I do think, um, and I think it'd be really interesting to sort of encourage students to do literary genealogy, because we know that we, you know, all literature is in conversation with the past. But what would happen, because that's what we've been taught, what would happen if we just studied that we're going to make that conversation differently. I think that that's the question that a lot of us have been asking for several years. I think in terms of what genres are emerging, I think the best, I mean, the, the texts that interest me are, you know, precisely, maybe the exception of my Mises, but maybe not, because that's a really strange book. I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, get that through the ref. <laughs> um, sort of here. Um, um, are innovative and mixing genres so like you know memoir for forget from this is a memoir but it's also a piece of um prose poetry and there are moments when um in you know, like beckett and he's so into um finding lost time that he disappears into lost time the whole thing breaks down he can't find a form for which to contain it um Bushani, i think is so interesting because of the way that book was made but also it is kind of um, in terms of, it's not in the tradition of climate romanticism, but in terms of a, a, of a book um, that's profoundly concerned with ecologies of um, life and profoundly concerned with the ecologies of oppression too. The way that it's both poetry, it's memoir, it's got um, Persian and um, Iranian traditions, it's got Kurdish traditions, and it was kind of made by several people. I mean, I think Bushani is a very, very gifted writer, but my God, his translator, I mean, is amazing too, the way that that book is echoed. So I think there is a generic pull always um, when something 
thing um, is, is happening. And I think we're just beginning um, to see that now, particularly um, in, in relation to um, ecocide um, as well. So in kind of ways, I want to say, I don't know, we, you know, but maybe this is, you know, I think, you know, I, as your students will tell you, the, the forms of the novel, the romantic poetry, the lyric were born out of a, a break in time. Thank you but so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Questions are coming thick and fast, so I'll just read the first one. How do you think, this is Alex Eaglestone, who's saying, how do you think literature relates and enmeshes with non-human rights, animal rights, land protection, and non-human time? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the sort of question I was edging towards. Um, it's a big question and there are um, people who've done much more work on this than I have. I think um, for me it's important to remember that the regime out of human rights came out of a particular history of the human. So whatever we do within that um, is going to be under that shadow. So there's always going to be um, a kind of colonialism of the human working with whatever rights frameworks. So that, that's one kind of qualification. Um, on the other hand, precisely because of that, I think it does want takes me back to what I think that writing and creativity can do. Um, that to rethink from out of under there has to kind of shake the human. Um, and the human never gets shaken unless it's actually shaken. And we've seen that in the last year. Um, you know, the connection that we are species, we are actually one species. And guess what? If, you know, lots of people die in one country, that is connected, that is part of being in a species war with, a, with another species, which is winning you know, the virus. <laughs> That's, um, um, you know, so at that point, the limits of the human come starkly into view. So this, I think this is really an opportunity um, for us to think about rights, not just about you know, rights of people who are less fortunate than ourselves and that um, tired narrative that seems to get nowhere because no one seems to really believe that, otherwise we wouldn't be living in um, such an appalling world. Um, but to think about what those limits of the human are. And maybe, you know, it's always the, uh, you know, people will say historians, old historians, old fashioned middle age historians will always say, and of course, what, you know, every time human rights happens, it happens because something violent and awful happens. And so maybe the next stage in terms of non-human rights will have to be born both out of this, this, this particular catastrophe, but more pressingly and probably more catastrophically um, um, uh, planeticide and, and the climate emergency. So I, I, it's, it's, what, I, what I think the tradition needs to be changed is the idea where you have the, the kind of moral sympathy version which comes from the 18th century which is you give other people qualified rights because otherwise everyone will kill each one another so it's a kind of enlightened self-interest i don't think enlightened self-interest that paradigm of human rights or rights is going to get us out of this particular mess um but i noticed that you, Steph, steph's on steph Krauss is on the call and he'll have things to say about that too um there's another question should we take that lindsay yeah. Um, and it's uh, Soleha Kamal, who says, in your book, you very insightfully criticize literary humanitarianism, saying, if you need to read a book to appreciate that there are other persons on the planet as human as you, in truth, your grasp of human rights is then probably not that promising to begin with. What then do you think is the function of discussions on human rights in fiction? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, um, that's a great question. I, I think, I think, I think we read in order to discover what it means to be human ourselves. I think literature is, is, is not about distributing sympathy, it's about human otherness. Um, and what I hate about the um, reading literature makes you give empathy to people like unlike ourselves, I kind of always want to come back and say, you know what you are? Why are you reading? I mean, most of us read because we don't know. <laughs> and not that we believe that there's some kind of fixed identity out there. It's just that we're, we're, we're curious and unsettled. And I think part of me 
part of writing that book, and it was why it was a book that really comes out of the classroom, is I wanted to get back to that sense of the value of literature, not actually having grand values, but being encounters of strangeness, difficulty, and otherness. It might be that then you do actually discover something of a commonality with other people or a common struggle, but it's not because you think you understand their lives. It's because you, know, you should be come away thinking, I don't, but I don't. You don't come away from Tolstoy and say, I got that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't wait going, oh God, <laughs> God, you know, fail again, fail better. Um, so I think it's that, that wanting to affirm as a kind of, you know, late humanist value or early, you maybe we're not there, early humanist value, um, but it's complexity and otherness and also what I cannot understand without, without making a fetish of that. Um, so that was what I was trying to get to there. It's also, you know, when he heard en endlessly during the pandemic, People have noticed that people are reading a lot, I mean, big time. I mean, anyone who teaches literature at the moment is going, so books are selling. And people keep on saying it's because people want to escape. Like, it's not because they want to escape, it's because they want to understand chaos. This is what literature allows you to do. Um, this is what writers um, can fix you in. Um, it might, you know, it might be you know, chaos without having, having to die of it, um, but it is, you know, um, an epistemological and effective world that presents you with hard, hard realities. That's what literature's good at. Oh. This is why I'm not a publisher. <laughs> we don't have any other questions in the Q&A box, um, but Elika has a question. Please go ahead, Elika. There's somebody drilling very loudly in my neighborhood. So um, they've just stopped. So. Um, Hopefully it's a charmed moment. Um, Lindsay, I mean, thank you for an exquisitely sort of woven paper. My, my, my question um, has something to do with weaving too. It, it kind of has to do with the methodology of, of the paper and, and of the readings that you were sharing with us. And that way in which you were juxtaposing those four, oh, sorry, those three texts that then um, with the return to Darwish at the end, maybe four, but you know, those three texts that that kind of spoke to each other and explored different versions of temporality and different versions of the moment. And I was really intrigued by your um, little aside, um, which I strongly identified with when you said that, you know, um, uh, trained as a modernist, you're good at reading for redemptive moments. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that, I've, I, you know, I share, I've always attuned to the redemptive moment mm -hmm. text, and then when it doesn't come, then what do you do? Um, and how the lack of the redemptive moment in Darwish, that passage is kind of shown up by the previous reading of Wolf through Auerbach. So I, I just wanted, I was simply intrigued. I mean, take it as you will. Um, what you feel you gained from those those layered and juxtaposed and woven readings. Yeah, I think um, I think I was just following my nose um, a, a bit with those. But I think the point about the coffee in Darwish is self-critique. But it's because he's. I mean, I, when I when I was writing the book, I kept on coming back to that. You know, I can say this now because I'm you know in my late fifties. I think there's good and bad writing. And good writing <laughs> does something to you, which puts you in very strange places um, in a way that lots of good writing doesn't do. What I was intrigued about, I think it, when reading the coffee and Del every time I read that description, a description of making a cup of coffee, that it does go on for pages. And I do recommend, especially if you like coffee, if you read these early pages from Memoir, Memory and Forgetfulness, because you, you, you can smell it. You want, you have to go make coffee. You then think, I've got to change my coffee. Um, and he loops back, you know, um, to um, his affair with um, the, the, the Lydia poet, the, I can't remember, the, poet, the relationship he had with an Israeli Jewish woman and the coffee they made together. And it's exquisite. Um, but why am I remembering the coffee and not the vacuum bomb? And that's exactly, Darwish knows he's put his reader in that position because that's precisely, um, you know, those, those two panes of, of glass that he wants us to see. And that's, that's not moral sympathy. 
that he's putting in his, his, his reader, that's moral discomfort. Um, um, and, you know, the, the ways in which the, 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 the dream, the Hargard's dream, which I still, I mean, I reread my thesis or read it if you haven't read it, is so brilliant. It's, it's written by someone who's passionate about literature, but he's also passionate about the world and wants the world to stay living, but it's a qualified dream. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the other thing I, um, I, I, I want to refer, and I, I know I'm talking to, um, 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 preaching to the crowd here because I think I, this call is full of some of the best close readers in the country, um, is the, the way that close re reading can reveal those kind of tensions and complexities. And I know that it sounds like a, an outrageous overstatement, in some ways it is, can give us another way of thinking about rights can give us another way of thinking about shared, shared humanism and what that might look like that isn't just law, that isn't just um, performative, or that isn't just political or social. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I completely agree, Lindsay, but, and, I mean, as, as you've just illustrated, isn't it interesting how the bringing together, the reading in conjunction, throws up some of those 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 tensions and oppositions and convergences i mean you you kind of wouldn't notice the almost um kind of scandalous intensity of the coffee moment if you didn't have the wolf plus Auerbach alongside kind of pulling you towards the redemptive moment and then you know then darwish flips it and reminds us of the of you know then there's a vacuum bomb as well it's it's that it's reading in conjunction, I think, that that, you know, yeah. your paper beautifully illustrates the power of. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's why I, that's why I do think it's the most interesting work in, in um, interpretative studies. I can't believe that says it's post-colonial comparative because I'm a post-colonial someone else. It just looks like I'm being really uh, creepy. Um, but I, I do precisely for, for, for those those reasons. And I know, you know your work and, and his work does precisely that. But I also want, especially when it comes to human rights, when I was thinking, um, um, when I was rereading Bushani's chapter 11 this afternoon, it's gone dark. Um, I don't know why I've gone dark. Um, but um, with people, people who have read that book will call it a memoir or a testimony, which it isn't, if solely, or a novel, um, which it isn't. Or, or it's just considered to be human rights work. And it's, I haven't, I haven't hardly seen anyone remark on the fact that Rubenus Vashani is an extraordinary writer. He's not just a prisoner in Manus Island who happens to have a WhatsApp and was a journalist. He is an extraordinary writer. I mean, he does things that, you know, um, and only to Falagan too, with that work of translation working through the Persian into English. And it's hardly ever mentioned. And so when you actually give people a book to read, they say, well, I found it quite challenging. And they don't mean the content because they actually, the people who pick up the book know that they're not going to get a pretty picture of the migrant refugee regime. What they mean is like, I found it challenging to read because it's a literary book. It's a very you know, self-consciously literary book. I'm not sure why I've gone dark. I'm still here. And, 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 and it's, I mean, your your mention of translation sorry I, i'll shut up after this but your mention of translation and of Auerbach and you know that key work of world literature that that mimesis is reminds us also that these that these works are translated right i mean all i'm, I'm right in thinking aren't i that all three are translated the darwish was in arabic written originally in yeah. arabic and so on um you know, I mean, this is a bit of a, it's a huge question, but you know, what, what does the fact of their being translated and bringing these translated texts into this kind of conjunction, what does that do? Mm. You know, I think um, they're all, I mean, apart from Arbok, they're all very consciously translated. So the way the paratexts around that are announced, so whether it's a question of translating from Arab, translating from Palestinian, when you have a later debate that goes through that, all the way up to Tamim Bagati, who until recently would not translate his work from Arabic. 
Um, and um, the Bujani is very self-consciously a work of translation and it is presented as such and as a work of collaboration. And in some ways, um, that is a reaffirmation of a sense of plurality because you're, you are getting the polyvalence of meaning, the shift, um, a kind of dialogism in, in the work itself as an ongoing process. So there is something, I wouldn't necessarily say it's democratic, but there's something collaborative and there are versions of solidarity that are necessary to that imaginative work. And I do think, you know, um, I can remember when I first started teaching, not at Birmingham, but at another university early in my career, there were a lot of um, um, uh, uh, European language and literature teachers who would just bemoan they would not teach Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or Flaubert unless it could be in the original. And it was a direct kind of like, like keeping the power. Um, unless you can learn Russian, why should I teach you Dostoevsky? And they can't even do French. You know, why aren't their French good enough? French good enough to be Flaubert, I mean, God. <laughs> um, your French has to be pretty good and you don't come from state school, right? Um, so that kind of, you know, opening up of translation as part of a collaborative plural practice of reading, and, and in some ways I do think there's a kind of rights work that goes on through that as well. And it's not just that, you know, now, now mass education is enforced, we can't be precious about it anymore because guess what, the people who only teach Russian don't have any jobs because there are no Russian literature departments left. Um, but it is about, you know, especially um, as students will know, um, students are reading in translation all the time. They're reading either online or online journals or bilingual journals. A lot of our students are bilingual or sometimes trilingual. Um, so I, I think I think that's a good thing that's come to, whether well, usually it's the policing of languages. I think it's one of the things that's risen to the surface. And of course, it does require interpretive work because, you know, there are interesting things where it goes wrong or something else is revealed in the translation. It's like the use of the word um, phenomenally in that passage I read from Bishani, I think that must be only, I mean, what did, you know, and I think oh, I must go check the Persian, ask Persian specialists how that someone knows phenomenal is working in that, because it works both ways for us, isn't it? It's like phenomenal and phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I think translation is a good part of the kind of literature I would associate with the rights and writing continuum of things. And also a good part of making the conjunctions and weaving and moving across. And... Mm. Thanks, Lindsay. We don't have any more questions in the Q&A, but I had a, a kind of a brief observation, Lindsay, and I'd love to hear a little more. So, you know, I was thinking about the documentary that Bushani made, and when you were talking about translation, I was thinking also that he's part Kurdish, so that must also mm -hmm. kind of, you know, in a way kick in, you know, that like a sort of a uh, an intertext or a subtext, uh, but the, his um, the documentary is called uh, Please Tell Us the Time, and, yeah. you know, this a sense that came came so strongly from you know especially the, your reading of the Darvish section that you know there are there are you know these authors who cannot escape the hegemony of external events um, but I also think that there is this kind of anxiety about the literary itself yeah. and about the investment of time the literary um, expects of us that you know if you don't do long form writing if you don't write a long novel if you are writing sort of tweets if your mind is coming out in cartoon strips then you, you are not mm -hmm. exactly author so it's not just you know kind of a an anxiety of really being in the midst but also this anxiety that you don't have time to be self-possessed and self-reflective enough to do um literary work that'll endure that'll mm -hmm. be a classic you know mm -hmm. that's the the kind of uh, um you've read my manuscript but you know the Tejuko drone stories you know the unborn classics because drones are falling on mm -hmm. uh, you know these these classics and they cannot go on to have that cultivation in time, which also includes, you know, the kind of critical reception of it. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's great. And of course, I do remember that bit in the book. I mean, in some ways, this paper, as you will recognise, is in dialogue with your book, because in the longer version of this paper, I start with Winnicott. But anyway, we can have another conversation about that. Um, but yes, also in the film, um, Chaka, tell me the time. Please tell me the time. Three observations. One is that um, the film itself spends a lot of time doing nothing or just looking at, you know, someone's feet by a fence or a long pan. So it's almost like Stephen Queen in like, it's going to make you stay in this time. It's not going to give you the next thing. 
And so in some ways it does reproduce the novel, the aesthetic of the novel, um, the novel, you know, I started with the book quite, quite well. But the other thing is, you know, can you tell me the time, the self-conscious, you know, the time I was talking about, the degradation of time. Um, but Chaka is a, the Chaka is a bird that only exists like the um, flowers that resemble chamomile, but are not chamomile, that only lives on Manus Island. So it's absolutely particular to um, Manus and does not, you know, go under those colonial taxonomies. Um, and it tells the time and it, it does this particular, as you'll remember from the film, chirrup noise it makes at six in the evening, and at six in the morning. And so um, everyone says, oh, that's, that's the time of, of Manus by this chaka bird. But the prison system, uh, within the prison system where, which is partly investigated in the film and alluded to in the book, um, there's a sort of basically a, 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 a isolation chamber, which is also described as a torture chamber um, that is on the outskirts of the prison where prisoners are said to be punished. And the Australian regime calls out Chaka, calls it the same name as the Manus bird. So this is, goes back to um, Elvis' point about translation. Uh, de you know, degrades the, you know, the absolute non-colonial particularity of Manus and the time at which the Manus Islanders and the prisoners are identifying with rather than this non-time of endless um, temporal degradation, the queuing for nothing, the waste of time, the, the deliberate um, making impossible of human time. But by reappropriating the word chaka and turning it into the name of the prison. So there's all those, those, those things together. Whether it's the long times, I don't know. I think that's probably more, um, yes, recollection in tranquility, but it's also, you know, it, that is part of the political economy of publishing. That, you know, it's always been rich guys who've got plenty of time who've made it. <laughs> and therefore they get to kind of, you know, set down the value of what a lasting piece of work is, because they're writing great books or little slim books with juicy insights that no one's ever made, apparently, before, but have endlessly. Um, and so they get to determine the, the, that, the, that value. And I do think, I mean, I, and, I, and I say this, you know, I've said it like endlessly, I feel, I feel it very strongly with this vulnerable body, which I think we've had conversations about before, we should have won the booker, because it's an extraordinary piece of work um, in, in, in that kind of, you know, non-empathetic modernist literature, um, but will not, I could see why it didn't. Um, and I and I have to say this about that, that book, and I say it about Bushami, this is a masterwork, and it, it would not be recognised as a masterwork, because it's been decided it's refugee testimony, or it's been decided it's sociology, or it's been decided, you know, because you know, people who are oppressed somehow can't be great okay. artists, <laughs> which of course is, is exactly. nonsense. We have one question, Lindsay, are you happy to take it? Mm -hmm. We can make that the last question. Um, so this is from Marissa DiMartino, <laughs> sorry. Um, I would ask, how could we contribute to social change through our research, studying writings and literary works? I think um, with increasing difficulty, um, and I make the point in the book, and it's non-trivial that the attack on the humanities and the attack on the literary culture um, is, is, is an attack on, on human rights and will um, not, um, will, is, is part of the kind of what's removing a culture of human rights. So by teaching literature and insisting on teaching literature and literary activism is already um, a piece of work before we even start to talk about um, research or writing. So I think, I think the teaching is going to get more and more important. I mean, there's some ways on a quite literal level, part of the Rights for Time project, which I'm involved with in Birmingham, which has had all its money, a lot of its money cut, like lots of other global challenges funds, um, is a project we're working with, with colleagues in Jordan, uh, with a, a neuroscientist called Rana Dajani. And she's works on intergenerational trauma, and literally the trauma that is on in people's brains that is carried through generations, and she's got the data. But she, the other side of her work is a mass reading program called We Love Reading, because she's also working out, um, seeing if, and it looks like it is the case, 
that um, reading literacy can undo generational trauma in terms of the brain. So you teach people to read um, and it actually can heal over time and over generations. Trauma done. So there's, there's a kind of really literal way in what we do. And it's not just you know, reading, it's reading fiction, it's reading stories does that. So I think we've got a real job of work both within the UK and particularly actually within the UK at the moment um, and elsewhere of um, refusing the kind of utilitarian reading, what is reading good for? You know, like, well, we can, we've got smarts to that, stops, you, stops people going mad, how about that? <laughs> um, um, but also in, in claiming um, um, the humanities and, and reading as a central part of civic and political life. Um, and I think, you know, this is going to become more and more difficult. But in terms of research, the amount of research money is going to be, is going to be more and more limited. So you really will end up with blokes reading big books and that will be research time. <laughs> and that will be like sort of, you know, art, the art history version of fine letters, um, if we're not very careful. So I can't be more um, cheerful. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you so very much again, Lindsay. This was an extremely vibrant, very hopeful, though, of course, we are looking at some very um, uh, hopeless realities. You know, as we speak, you know, the numbers of uh, infected and dying in India are in such a, you know, this it's called about this, you, this, this idea of distant suffering. You know, I often find myself weeping about people's uncles and aunties, I don't know. So it's just a very, very peculiar stage. And as you said, it's also a very interesting time for us to think about human rights, social equality, social justice, distributive justice, so on and so forth. So thank you so very much for bringing all these home to us. Erika, would you like to announce the next uh, seminar before we finish? Yeah, and, and just also to, to say, Lindsay, I, th I mean, an extraordinary paper and, and very much, um, as Anki's been saying, I think pitched to speaking of moments, this moment, this very, very complex um, and, and uh, agonizing moment, really, in the world. I was, I was so separate, if you'll allow me a digression from it, I was separately listening to a paper by a, a virologist earlier today as part of my heavily cut UKRI project. And um, the virologist was saying that we absolutely need to think of humanity as a species and to think of the species as being vaccinated everywhere before we are safe. You know, so, so kind of species mentality that you were touching on is absolutely crucial also for, for, for these times. So I mean, thank you so much for an incredibly moving and, and inspiring paper if also you know a, 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 a suitably thought-provoking um, and reflective one thanks so much um, thank you very much for hosting me so but next year Oxford I hope I, and you have to promise to come back soon yes <laughs> we have to have you in person well yes. and, and then, also... so, sorry Anki I'm, 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 I just remembered what you tasked me with I would like to remind everyone that um, we meet again this time next week um, to hear from Dora Wiesa um, from the University of Warwick, who is going to speak about indigenous rights, especially in North America. Um, so uh, do sign up for that and uh, it will be great to see everyone again. And now I'll hand over to Anki for the final word. Yes, and, and finally, thank you to our wonderful participants, Lindsay, that they're, you know, our students are really, they make for such a lively and engaged audience. And some of them have been coming to this for years. So there is a really interesting critical mass that Elika and I feel very happy and proud about them. I hope you can come here and engage with them in person yeah, and also drink with them. They're also steady drinkers, so drink with them in person. Um, but before we, before I say goodbye, I'd love to thank Nikki yes. for, for really kind of uh, getting us through this and also Torch for giving us this wonderful platform from which we can um, sort of convey the post-colonial seminar, which, which matters so much to so many of us in Oxford. Thank you again, Lindsay. Thank you, Thank Erica, you, my Torch. pleasure. Go well. Go well.